It is hard to say how the founder of the Ottoman Empire came to establish one of the world's greatest empires, but legends abound. The Ottomans derived most of their power from their vast landmass. Having witnessed the Romans rise, they understood that assimilation had to come about in a specific manner. The conquered nations enjoyed a healthy degree of autonomy and freedom in the Ottoman Empire. They knew that dead enemies did not pay taxes, so allowing nations to exist in a state of restricted freedom, an oxymoron, facilitated good relations and trade throughout the kingdom. The Ottomans used a system of meritocracy in which people from all parts of the kingdom could experience vertical movement within the socio-political sphere. They divided the empire into military fiefs called tamars. In exchange for the right to collect taxes in the kingdom, each locality was expected to provide cavalrymen for the realm. The land did not belong to the local leaders, so the central leadership could expand and reduce it based on the tamar's ability to send troops and its domestic performance. This process allowed good leaders to work toward central roles, while weak leaders were weeded out. This degree of vertical movement was unprecedented for its time and remains so today. Since people came from everywhere to contribute to the Ottoman Empire, there was relatively less prejudice in the public sphere, allowing for a healthy approach toward politics. Another practice that brought the various nations of the empire together was Devshirme. According to the Devshirme, parents could give their sons to the state to avoid their taxes. It manifested itself in different forms, including forced conversions. However, one should not look at stories of the past with a contemporary lens. These children were handed over to the government, who had them trained in the arts of war. These boys would grow up and become Yanisheri, or new troops. The Janissaries were a credible force in Asia Minor, and their loyalty to the Sultan provided them with several privileges. How the Ottomans got into power is crucial to understanding what made them the commanding force of the region. The story of Ottoman consolidation in Anatolia and their subsequent expansion towards the east and the south is fascinating. At first, the Ottomans, known as the Osmanli at the time, were merely one among many Turkish tribes that populated Anatolia. Then, in 1302, they encountered and devastated a Byzantine army at Basfius near Constantinople. The Byzantine failure was due to unfortunate circumstances, but the Ottoman force was indeed on par with the Eastern Roman Empire within a century. Eventually, this Turkish Empire evolved and became the sole inheritor of both Byzantine and other Turkish states. Two centuries earlier, in the 11th century, another tribe, the Seljuk Turks, invaded the eastern frontier of Christian Byzantium. The Turks migrated into the Middle East and Anatolia and toward the Byzantine coastlines. Near the end of the 12th century, they grew so strong that they defeated the Byzantine army, led by Emperor Manuel I Komnenos. The Byzantine forces were weak during the Fourth Crusade, and the Turks could expand almost effortlessly. However, their domination was not meant to last. Soon, after the peak of the Seljuk success, another invader came and overwhelmed the Turks. The mighty Mongol army, led by the successors of the formidable Genghis Khan, sacked their territories. The Mongols did not intend to stay in Anatolia and the Balkans, and they left shortly after. But the situation in the region was now much different than it had been when they came. Instead of a single Seljuk Empire, which was taking shape when the new invaders appeared at the beginning of the 14th century, there were numerous Turkish emirates in Anatolia. One of them was the emirate of Osman I, the founder of the Ottoman Empire. Their time had just begun. At first, Osman controlled a small area encompassing the town of Sogut. From there, he attacked the Byzantine frontiers many times. In his first triumph at the Battle of Basphius, he crushed the imperial army, which helped him lay the foundation for the Ottoman state. Osman certainly did not want other Turks as enemies. Their territories were far more extensive than his, and the emirs were much more powerful than he was at the time. Osman only fought the local Byzantine nobles, and not even all of them. He opted for a peaceful solution whenever he had a chance. By slowly expanding and assimilating other cultures, the Ottomans would continue their ascent toward multi-continental dominance. This eclectic group of natives became the foundation of Osman's empire. Osman began to take castles and other landmarks, and the more success he had with his ragtag volunteer army, the more people began to flock to this new local source of power. And so began this Ghazi state 
a collection of people from all religious backgrounds, including Orthodox Islam, Turkish shamanism, Jewish, and Christianity. Osman and his successors did not seem to mind much that they ruled over such a heterogeneous bunch of folks. The official attitude toward all religions was reasonably sympathetic, and they divided people more by military and civilian classes anyway. Religion was not a classifying distinction. Over time, Islam became the defining religious practice in the empire, but that did not mean the empire demanded that all its subjects conform or convert. In fact, the 15th century saw Christianity as the dominant religion. Sultans were trained to be mindful of Islamic law, but they organized their empire with the millet system, in which ethnic and religious minority groups were granted the power to govern themselves, under the watchful eye of the central government. Just as the Ottomans were considerate and tolerant of other faiths, they held women in high esteem. In fact, for quite a while, the state was effectively ruled by women. This society was not a backward one, as Western thought presented it around a century ago by calling it the sick man of Europe. That image was created during the period of the state's irreversible decline. For centuries, the Ottoman Empire had been a dominant force with a clear hierarchy, advanced administration, similar to the Roman system of provinces, and wise rulers. Evil rulers were usually regarded as crazy, then overthrown or killed so that they could not harm their subjects and damage the empire. The defining aspect of their fame is the control of Constantinople, which they would rename Istanbul. Conquering Constantinople had been the ultimate aspiration for every Ottoman Sultan since the beginning of this story. It was not only because of its strategic position and virtual invulnerability, but because this magnificent city had immense symbolic value. The Byzantine imperial city was territorially, politically, culturally, and religiously the center of the world at the time. According to Muslim legends, taking this city would be the ultimate proof that the Ottomans, or whoever managed to capture it, were predestined to rule the world. Between the first Arab siege in the 7th century and Sultan Mehmed's actions, 11 more Muslim rulers had tried to crush its defenses, but the city walls had persisted. On April 5, 1453, Sultan Mehmed II marched on Constantinople with an army of 130,000 men, a navy that surrounded the city coast and modern weapons, including the mightiest cannons the world had seen before, built mainly to penetrate the Byzantine walls. During the third wave of the assault, nearly two months later, the Sultan entered the city with his janissaries and the rest of his troops. May 29th was the day of the Byzantines' defeat, or, from the Ottoman perspective, the most significant victory in all history. Sultan Mehmed II had become the conqueror. However, Mehmed was not there to sack the city. After the terrifying night when the walls were destroyed and people killed, the Sultan ordered an end to killing innocent people and the beginning of reconstruction work. He allegedly regretted not managing to persuade Emperor Constantine to surrender the city and prevent all the damage. Having captured the creme de la creme of imperial cities, Sultan Mehmed II and his successors would expand toward the Balkans in the east. They also made headway into North Africa and the Levant taking over Egypt and Syria from the Mamluks. From Bosnia, Wallachia, and Genoese colonies in the Aegean to some parts of Greece, the Ottomans' expansion soon became the envy of the Islamic world, just like the Romans had been in the West. The fall of Constantinople not only redefined substantial land holdings and trade barriers, but also shaped the Muslim and Christian faiths. Before 1453, Constantinople stood out as a holdout for the Christian faith and the zeal that defined it. With the reign of Mehmed II, however, Muslim mosques replaced Christian icons. The European zeal faded, to be replaced by a thriving Eastern counterpart. Having taken on three different regions successfully, North Africa, Middle East, and Eastern Europe, the Ottomans were reigning supreme from the central locations of the planet, which means that they were sitting on some of the most important trade routes in the world. The trade network of Constantinople stretched halfway across the globe from the northern climes of Viking territory to the palm fronds and rice fields of Asia. The Hagia Sophia still bears Viking graffiti. The uncreative Halvdan carved these runes, a testimony to its varied population and rich and diverse history. Istanbul, previously Constantinople, has been a crucial trade route throughout history. The Eastern Roman Empire, or later the Byzantine Empire, had controlled large parts of Europe and the Levant. 
Centuries-old trade routes assisted their supremacy over these lands. The elaborate network of roads that the Romans built and the defensive fortifications of the Byzantine rule helped the Ottomans exert their control. The existing Seljuk network of caravanserais, roadside inns for travelers, was also a great help. After the fall of Constantinople, the Ottomans considered themselves the true successors of the Romans. Mehmed II even called himself Kaiser e Rum, or the Caesar of Rome. Like the empires that preceded them, the Ottomans used their lands to facilitate trade. While the Ottomans traded overland, they were not adept seafarers like, say, the Vikings. The Ottoman Empire was an agrarian economy, and most of its revenue came in the form of taxes, both on land and on exports. The empire collected taxes on non-Muslims, or jizya, across its territories. The Devshirma system took care of the rest, so that civilians contributed either by assisting the economy or the military. The Ottoman control over the Silk Route increased their tax collection. However, once Europeans discovered the sea route to India, the Sultan's taxes from the land trade witnessed a decline. Over time, the Ottoman Empire lost its stable footing. There were enemies at all gates. The Holy Roman Empire stood in the west. Spain was taking over the sea trade. Eastern Europe was primarily unstable, and the Russians were not to be trifled with, especially in regards to their territory. Even though the Ottomans had a formidable army, they could not take on all these challenges. After they tried and failed to take Vienna for the second time, the empire entered a period of steady decline. While some might praise the Ottomans for allowing administrators and bureaucrats from various nations, others would say it led to a lack of unity and cohesiveness. Trouble was always brewing in the Balkans, destabilizing the entire region, including the Turks. Under Austrian and Russian influence, the Balkans were further weakened by rebellions and insurrections. By the 19th century, the winds of time had deteriorated the Ottoman Empire. When the First World War arrived, they ended up siding with Germany, and the rest is, as they say, history. To learn more about the Ottoman Empire, check out our book, Ottoman Empire, a captivating guide to the rise and fall of the Ottoman Empire, the fall of Constantinople, and the life of Suleiman the Magnificent. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.